You are listening to a CGSW podcast. For more podcast initiatives, visit our website at cgsw.com slash podcasts. The following CGSW program, Am I Right?, contains foul language and mature content. Listener discretion is advised. This week on Am I Right? We have a very, we have a serious discussion. It's very comedy. serious. I'm not even screaming. No, not even, uh, not even serious. That's not, it's, it's just a an in depth discussion of the comedy of uh, of Anthony Jeselnik. We get a, we get an in depth look at the process of creating one of the best comedy records of the past ten years. Oh yeah, this is this is by far my favorite. Well, I don't know if I want to say by far because I don't want to offend too many people. But guys, get in line if you're making comedy records. Listen to Shakespeare. Get it from iTunes. There's a new standard. Oh man, the standard has been set, and uh, we have a we have an interview with Anthony Jeselnik where we kind of he talks about it, tells us how he did it. Uh, this is like MythBusters, uh, how it is made, uh, and am I right? All put together. I don't think there's any better way to describe it than that. Jesse, so let's get to Jesse it. Just even does it in that that uh, French Canadian accent, like on how things are made or how it's made. Um, on a, on a different note, <laughs> uh, listen to the "How Did This Get Made" podcast by Paul Shear. Just, it, just oh, I'm reminded one. of it. It's very funny. Uh, I was thinking of that show on the Discovery Channel, though. Where I'm, I totally know what you meant, okay. but it, okay. that's that's what jogged. It's it's very funny. <laughs> Paul Shear is incredible. Mentioned in the interview. Too, that's right. So. so stay tuned. You listen. To Am I right on CGSW 90.9 FM or on CGSW.com slash podcast? And, and just so everybody knows, we're going to be playing Anthony's bits throughout the uh, the hour here, and they're, they're kind of offensive, but we ad- offensive. but we address them beforehand. Exactly. So so don't don't be too offended. Just laugh. <laughs> Let's do it. We'd like to welcome a, a very special guest today. Very special. Um, Jesse and I were talking about this just yesterday, I think. Uh, this this next guest, his CD. Many a text message was shared that said, I can't believe how fucking good Shakespeare is. Yeah, Shakespeare is so good. Actually, uh, I don't even know if it's a CD. We'll, we'll talk about that during okay, the interview. Okay, that's interesting. Uh, <laughs> Anthony Jeselnik, uh, the CD is Shakespeare, uh, the comedian again, Anthony Jeselnik. Welcome to Am I welcome Right? Welcome to the show. Thank you. I'm I'm really excited to be a special guest, and I just found out that I can swear, which is awesome. Yes. Thank you, guys. Swear away. <laughs> yeah, but actually, perfect. now that you've brought it up, there's a quota, though. You got to okay, keep count. What's, what's the quota? Like per person, or is it like just an overall? Just overall, like we've got we've got to hit 25. It's a tone. Okay. When you feel offensive, we've we've done it. <laughs> Great. Perfect. Perfect. Okay, that brings me to a question, though. It's a lot of the jokes on the record. Are offensive, right? I mean, that's that's <laughs> kind of the goal, right? Sure, sure. But there's no, there's like minimal swearing. It's it's funny you bring that up because I feel like there's minimal swearing, but I'll get emails that are like, "You swear too much," or like, "Why do you have to swear so much?" And I really don't feel like I do. Like I swear a lot in person, but on stage I try to keep it to a minimum because the jokes are so offensive. I don't want to give people an excuse to tune it out. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. I feel like all the, all the swearing is kind of a turn off. Then they're not going to really take the full force of my uh, my abortion joke. You know, that I really, <laughs> that I really want to, to get. Like, there's real, there's real ideas there to be offended by rather than just foul language. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Like, and swearing isn't shocking anymore. No, not at all. You know, it can become tiresome uh, pretty quickly. I... I've always kind of enjoyed swearing. You know, I just like the sound of like a good fuck. You yeah. Know? Mm-hmm. But uh, but I worked uh, one of my one of my early jobs. You know, before I became a full time stand up comedian, was working for a TV show in America called Deadwood, mm-hmm. uh, which I don't know if you guys have heard of. But oh, it's amazing. Know, that show they swore so much that you know, you'd just be by working there, it just made everything. You know, I just uh, cunt became part <laughs> of my vocabulary. Uh, it, it, was, it was awesome, and it, it's kind of stayed with me ever since. Was there actually anyone nicknamed uh, San Francisco Cocksucker that worked on the, the crew of Deadwood? <laughs> I don't think they actually called anyone that, but everyone was a cocksucker. You know I, mean? <laughs> I once called my boss, who was like a 55-year-old woman, a cunt, and she looked at me with these big wide eyes, and I held up the script I had been reading, and I was like, I'm so sorry. <laughs> she forgave me right on the spot, and I was like, I can't believe I work in a place. Where I can call my my boss a cunt and she won't she won't fire me on the spot. What did you do on Deadwood? I was an accounting clerk. Like that was my oh, so you were punching I, I, I went to script. college uh, for uh, with a deg- for a degree in English literature, mm-hmm. and my parents said, you know, well, we will let you do that if you get a minor in business. So 
so that when you're unemployable with your English degree, you can get a job somewhere. Yeah, I know and that one. What Andy. I did for years in uh, in Los Angeles was work as an accounting clerk on TV shows. You know, uh, sending out invoices and the, the worst job you can have on a TV show by far. So you didn't actually get to meet, you, like you you weren't there while David Behind Milch the scenes. is laying on the on his back dictating. Like he didn't dictate the the jokes to you, I guess. He was he was like you know ten feet away from me lying down in a trailer. Uh, great trivia, by the way. I'm glad you guys know that that he would just lie there and dictate uh, the scripts. But yeah, he was, he was close <laughs> by, but never got to say more than a couple words to the guy. But always thought he was a uh, he was a genius. <laughs> it, was great to, it was great to work there just to, you know, just to be around it. Did any of that method rub off on you? Like, have you ever done sets? Uh, like, at the UCB, you could probably do, like, pretty on your free back, form, yeah. pretty free form, do Anthony Jeselnik does, because you do the Dane Cook thing, you could do a David <laughs> Milch thing. Yeah, I, I uh, you know, I, not really. I mean, I don't do a lot of improv <laughs> stuff. That Dane Cook thing is, like, I've done that, like, twice in my life, you know, that, that, you, that you see that on YouTube. Uh, not so much of that, not so much. But when I was on Deadwood, I was like just kind of coming into my own as a comic. I remember people from Deadwood coming to see me, you know, do a uh, do a show one night. It was before I had ever done a TV set or any of that stuff. So when you say coming into your own, this is this it actually kind of dovetails nicely into one of the things we wanted to ask. Yeah, like, how long have you been at it? Yeah, a uh, little over eight years now. And and when I did? Kind of, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Uh, I, a little over eight years. I kind of you know I. I uh, I don't have an exact date. What I kind of go by is the release date of the movie Comedian, Jerry Seinfeld's <laughs> uh, movie. I had, you know, taken a stand-up class, you know, prior to that, and uh, which no one, everyone always, you know, craps all over. But I, uh, I thought it was it was kind of valuable. Like you know, one if you of want these to break Louis the rules ones? a little bit, you got to know what the rules are. Was it one of these Louis uh, Anderson couple week long <laughs> ones? Like, uh, no, it was no. not one of those. Believe in yourself. Uh, things. It was more of just like a here's how kind of jokes work a little bit. Uh, take the mic out of the stand, don't run the light, show up half an hour early. Like one of those things that like if you didn't have the balls to just walk into an open mic and get up there, you know, it kind of helped me hone up. Like I had like seven minutes of material when I was done with it and I just went, you know, out with that. And you know, at the end of the show, you have like a big showcase where you invite your friends and everyone in the class does a seven minute set. And I had this great set. I was thrilled with it. And I thought, well, I know how to do stand up comedy now. I just go say those words and uh, I know what I'm doing. And then I went up like a week later uh, to do like an open mic somewhere and bombed so badly. <laughs> like I'll never forget, like, almost like a panic attack. Like I've never experienced anything like it since where it just kept pouring out of every, uh, out of like my whole body, like getting in my mouth where I could barely talk because I had so much sweat in my mouth. <laughs> that I couldn't get on stage again for months. And then I saw the movie Comedian like opening day. I was really excited about it. And that just, uh, I mean, I took that movie to heart so much that I just, Decided, you know, it was all about stage time and writing, and just went and uh, and you know worked my tail off and never never looked back. Yeah, seeing Jerry eat it's probably <laughs> probably helpful. No, oh, totally. I mean, he was, his whole thing was like, there's no shortcut. It's just stage time and writing. That's Did all you, you got to do. So you went back to your file folders and you checked to see what jokes you had that worked, uh, just like Orny Adams does, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. I had my I had my folder of Jewish material <laughs> that I went through. And, uh, and went at it. No, I, 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 w- I think I worked for like a year maybe just doing, like I told the same couple of stories. I had a story about getting fired from a Borders books. Uh, and I had a story about my girlfriend uh, accidentally burning down my apartment in college. <laughs> and I just told those everywhere I went. And then I, went, and I was bored with it. I hated it. And I was, you know, 23, 24 years old, didn't have anything. I didn't think I was interesting at all. And I was right. Uh, but I, <laughs> I saw a guy one night uh, doing one-liners at an open mic, and I'd always loved that kind of style. But it just seemed impossible. It seemed like Stephen Wright was this like unattainable genius, that only he could do that, or only Mitch Hedberg could do that. Mm-hmm. When I saw this guy doing it, I thought, oh, that's it. So when I started just going home and writing as many jokes as I could. Where did your twist on it? Because that's that's one thing that I really like about this is, I mean... It's not just one-liners. It's not just one-liners. Like, this persona is as much the... The, the joke, I mean, just uh, the listeners could probably tell from the clip we played before this, Anthony's a pretty nice guy here. On Absolutely. CD, he's a prick. Like, you're just, <laughs> you're such an asshole. Uh, but that, like, uh, that enriches it. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, that's, you know, that's the point. I came from a couple of different places. You know, uh, one was that to be able to tell, like, my, my big influence was a guy named Jack Handy. Right. Who yeah. did a thing called Deep Thoughts for Saturday Night Live. And it was, I thought these were the funniest things in the world. And I would get all the books, you know, he had like four books, and I would read through them and write jokes. Uh, but they were not, you couldn't sustain them. Like the funniest ones of those, you couldn't get up on stage and say them. It wouldn't get a big laugh. 
in a stand-up setting. So I had to try and to find a way to, you know, to turn it, to make it, uh, to get that laugh. Mm-hmm. And also I found that coming up as like a young, you know, a young, uh, you know, decent looking white kid doing stand-up, the crowd hated me already. <laughs> you know, they were like, who is this, who is this guy? Who, who does he think he is to come up here? And, you know, I was just like everybody else kind of. So I thought, well, if you think I'm a jerk already, I'm going to show you what a jerk is. You know, I'm going to turn it up to I'm going to turn it up to 11 and really give it to you. And the third part was just being kind of nervous and and not being comfortable on stage and hating that feeling of being new and having to go through that work. That I thought, well, what if I just pretend that I'm some kind of genius who's been doing this for 10 years? No one has to know it's my it's my I've been on stage for six months. I'll just pretend. And when the audience started going me with it going with me on it. I was as surprised as anybody. <laughs> and I just thought, well, let's see how mean I can get and let's see how how off putting I can be and see what see what happens. And I'm still following that. I'm still surprised uh, at how much uh at how much how, how mean people let me be and then how surprised they are when they meet me afterwards to find out that I'm nice, that I'm not a complete a complete asshole. You know, it, it kills <laughs> But this is so, so that's like the bummer of meeting Andrew Dice Clay after the show. He actually is a dick. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so you wait. So it was only six months it took you to to because you hear so much like people say seven years or ten years or, or whatever, and then six months you kind of Figured boxed in what what you what you what you were gonna do. Sure, but it was almost like a science experiment that I was like, I wonder if I can sustain this. I wonder if I can do 30 second one liners pretty much, you know, or two liners, whatever you want to call them. Yeah. I wonder if I could do that. How hard is that going to be to get a seven minute set, a <clears> 10 minute? <throat> like, could I do it as a, you know, as a 45 minute, 50 minute CD? I wasn't sure. Right. So I had, I, I'm always kind of playing with it and figuring out, you know, do I do a little crowd work here? Do I add a little story? You know, what kind of story can I tell? and not have it be jarring to go back to one-liners. I'm always kind of toying with it and figuring it out. Uh, but I think, you know, for people to say 10 years, 20 years even sometimes, I think that's if you're coming from a very personal place and you're kind of just talking about yourself because you've got to be relatable to other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I personally, like, don't, I'm not interested if someone's telling me about their, <laughs> their bad relationship with their girlfriend. Like, I just don't care. I'd rather just hear the jokes and marvel at the structure, whereas a lot of people, you know, couldn't care less about, about a clever joke. So, mm-hmm. so do you find then you're like, now that you have this voice that is so, you know, it, it's pretty, it's pretty well defined. Like, do you end up writing jokes that are too nice or they're good jokes about your, your girlfriend or your, your brother or, or whoever you're making these jokes about? Like, do you find that you produce more or that you throw more away or like, how has it changed the, uh, the process from, especially uh, from what you learned from that class? <laughs> uh, it's, I mean, the class thrown out everything I learned in that class, except for don't run the light and, t- and, uh, and you know, t- don't hit yourself in the face with the microphone. I mean, that was, it was just like, it was just something to get me on stage for the first time. You know, yeah. people say those classes don't teach you how to be funny. Of course they don't. But it, if it gives you the confidence to walk into an open mic for the first time, then by all means, spend $250 and go take one. Um, but, uh, I, I think my process has changed where in the beginning I would just write jokes. Like I didn't care what it was. Like that was kind of the freedom of being a new comic was being able to try anything and just throw it up there and see what sticks. And about, you know, a, a year in or so I was in an open mic and I, I did this joke. Uh, it's on the album, the joke about my girlfriend being addicted to chocolate. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? I told yeah. that joke and the reaction was such like an oh and a laugh. Yeah, and I thought, oh, that's it. My girlfriend loves to eat chocolate. She's always eating chocolate. You know? She likes to joke she's got a chocolate addiction. Like, keep away from those chocolate bars, Anthony. I'm addicted to them. And it is really annoying. <laughs> so I put her in a car. I took her downtown. And I pointed out a crack addict. And I said, you see that, honey? Why can't you be that skinny? <laughs> You guys seem like nice people. I don't want to sound like a jerk here. But that joke usually gets a standing ovation. Everything's got to be mean and, you know, smart. So now I write, I throw out a lot of jokes, but I have to write less jokes. Right. Mm -hmm. Because I kind of know what I'm going for. But I'll have jokes that I think are really funny that just aren't mean enough or that the stakes aren't high enough. (laughs) You know, it's not enough for me to, like, unplug my girlfriend's alarm clock 
You know what I mean? I've got to like, I've got a, you know what I mean? It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, it's a, it's kind of a corner I've painted myself into, but it's become, and I thought maybe this would, this will be awful. Like I won't enjoy it once I get to a certain point, but it's the opposite has been true. That I feel like I've gobbled up enough material and like things around that I've got to, I've got to reach a little further to come up with the new, with the new joke. It's not just repeating kind of old stuff. You know, which is hard, but I think that's what makes it rewarding. Yeah. H- have you been working on stuff since since this came out? Oh, like a, like a madman. I mean, I, I recorded it and uh, I recorded the album in May, and as soon as I was done with it, I was writing. I was writing the next, you know, the next thing. I've got maybe, I've got maybe fifteen, maybe close to twenty minutes of new stuff. Okay. But it's it's hard to get it to stand on its own. You know, with, with the with the, if I put it into that CD, it mm-hmm. it, it holds up. But to do it on its own without the, like, there's some really, you know, killer jokes in there that kind of prop it up, but that I don't have those just yet, or I'm, I don't have enough of those. Okay. That it's been, it's been a challenge, but it's one that I, you know, attack happily. So what, how do you, how do you write? Like, do you, do you sit down and just write everything out and then, and then just say it on say, or what's your process for what you, you like and, and what doesn't work? Uh, you know, I've, I tried, you know, just writing, uh, writing, you know, a couple jokes a day and going and trying them all out, you know, or the ones that I didn't think I, that might work. Uh, I, I like that, but that kind of got, it became kind of a drag because it seemed like I was going up and bombing every night with this new material <laughs> that I didn't like. So, and I, I kind of like, you know, reminding myself that I'm good at this. You know, like, it's nice to do well uh, and sneak in a new joke. But what I like to do now is I like to write, I spend a week or two and I write about 50 jokes. Okay. Um, and I don't even think about them. Like, I just write it. I don't think it's just mean enough. Is it smart enough? Is it even a joke? I just write it and move on to the next one. Once I have about 50, I read back through them, and I cull it down to about 20 jokes. I throw out 30 off the bat, and I'll go to a show. I'm like, like a place here in New York where I recorded the album, the Upright Citizens Brigade Theater in New York is great. Right. You know, it's, 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 the, the free shows are $5 shows. And I'll go to one of those and just walk out with a, with a, uh, with a, you know, a packet of, of jokes. And I'll say, this is what I'm doing. I'm going to read through these and see what works and what doesn't. And I go through them and it's really fun to do. And maybe I have after that, out of those 50 jokes I started with, I've got like five jokes left that I'm like, wow, I'm really excited about these. And I'll go and do those jokes and maybe I'll have, I'm thrilled if I've got three new good jokes out of that. Do you, you know, my, I, I throw out a lot of stuff. It and, sounds like it. And what are the, I mean, what are the audiences like at the UCB uh, compared to kind of like, I, 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 a typical seen, club. Like a typical club. Like, cause UCB crowds are a little bit more educated. Yeah. A little bit more hip wise. to comedy yeah. and they're a little bit more daring. Like is, is, do you find a difference between performing for them, uh, people at the UCB or people at, you know, a regular. Yeah. Like when you tour with this, is it, is it rougher on the road? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Uh, because they're, they're, the UCB crowds are a little more educated, but they're also kind of younger, mm-hmm. and they're, they're educated about uh, who's a little bit famous. You know, to be honest, with you, that it's like it's, it's kind of like a. Uh, they're excited to see someone they've heard of before, mm-hmm. and they're only paying five dollars, or it's free. Right. So there's not really much on the line, and they're excited to hear you try out new jokes. If I walk into, like, my favorite club here in New York is the Comedy Cellar. Mm-hmm. You no, know, it's like it's the one they you know Seinfeld goes to the whole time in comedian. Yeah. It's a great club, it's it's a Louis. tough club. Mm-hmm. Yeah, exactly. But you can't. You, if I walked up there with a pad of paper and said, "Here's my new jokes," they would. It would be awful. It would. They would not appreciate it because they're paying fifteen, twenty bucks and two drink minimum. You know. So if you what, like, I'll take the five jokes I have from UCB that I really love, right? And they'll, they'll laugh at everything at UCB because they just kind of appreciate hearing you do new stuff. It's like something special for them. They know no one else is getting. So you get like a bet, you get kind of a different laugh. Mm-hmm. But I know I'll take those five and go to the cellar, and they'll tell me what I really have. So you it, know, then I know it's like you, you, when you're speaking earlier about comedian, like Jerry Seinfeld says in comedian, I don't get, I get three free minutes off the top because I'm Jerry Seinfeld. Yeah. Um, but do you find at the UCB you you can get your whole fifteen minutes free there? Like is no, it, not at all. No, you okay. can bomb. I mean, they, they've got to be good jokes, you know, or they've got to kind of see what you're doing at least. You know, they might not work, but like. But uh, there's a humor, I think, for them in seeing me tell a joke that doesn't work for the first time, you know. <laughs> that there's no ego really behind it, and I'll have a facial reaction, or I'll cross it out. And they enjoy that just as much as if it's, like, a really, you know, a great joke that kills. Right. Now, what, what about at the comedy cellar, though? I mean, that's become, you know, since Comedian, and, and you know, it's in, like, it's in Louis a lot. Like, it's, it's certainly, its profile has raised in the last 
mm-hmm. couple of years. Like, and that's almost a pilgrimage spot now too. I'd say for for people that are in New York going to comedy, like, are they are they a more are they at the comedy cellar? Are they a little bit more of an educated crowd as well? Is that a, is that a good place to earmark whether I, something will work on the road? I don't know if educated would be enough, but it's it's a it's a great cross section, and it is full. You know, like, they yeah. at least want to see comedy. People come to the comedy cellar, like, there's a club here called, like, the New York Stand-Up Club, or the New York Comedy Club, Inspired which I've never name. been in. I've never even gone by. <laughs> mm-hmm. but you hear about it, and if somebody walks in there, i got to think they have no idea what the hell they're doing. Yeah. If they did, they would go to the comedy cellar. You know, so I feel like the people in there, for the most part, are there for comedy, and they're kind of, like, willing to let you do things. You know, and I'm not, like, quite known enough yet that I can, that I get that grace at all. Mm-hmm. Right. Maybe a few people know me, but it's still, it's like an uphill battle, even telling one-liners, because they're just like, oh, this guy's not talking about, you know, Obama right now. Like, <laughs> oh, I've learned a ton, but it's, yeah. but it's very little is comedy related. You know, it's like, <laughs> it, it, kind of, it, it kind of, like, relaxes you that no one, and maybe it's a New York thing, but it's also like a seller thing that everyone's pretty confident in what they're doing. Mm-hmm. The people just kind of hang out and make fun of each other and joke around. And it's it's a lot more it's a lot more fun and uh, congenial might be the right word but it's you know you got to kind of be on your toes excuse me but they it, it, it's everyone respects each other and you just have a great time like tonight I can't uh, after I get off the phone with you guys I'm going to the cellar tonight and it's like Jim Norton Tom Papa uh, Robert Kelly you know oh, wow. uh, all these these great mm-hmm. comics all just sitting around the table just BSing about whatever you know I'm sure we'll just talk about. Jimmy Buffett falling off the stage for 20 minutes. <laughs> it's always, uh, it's always a blast. Do you have it's any? Do you have anything prepared for that discussion? Do you have any reminders? <laughs> oh no, you got to just you got to walk in cold. It's got to be up the top of your head. If they even sniff out that you have prepared a joke for the table, it's over. It's over. <laughs> They're checking your Twitter feed stuff to see. Yeah. Jeslin like said that today. Piece of shit. Why would you bring canned <laughs> yeah. material to a discussion? Well, I don't know. The guys at the Algonquin <laughs> Roundtable would do it. Okay. <laughs> and that's kind of like what this is, I'm assuming, having never been invited. I don't think you're going to get an invitation. <laughs> hey, Anthony, I've never been invited to the... Uh... <laughs> What's that? I think you, the phone cut out for a second. It sounded like you were asking me <laughs> a favor. Yeah, no, it's okay. You'll you'll have to just hear about it when, when it goes to air tonight. <laughs> So let's talk about uh, about Shakespeare then for for a couple minutes here. You've made like every top ten list, every comedy blog, every comedy, uh, um, you know, every website out there. Every Everybody magazine, who covers comedy, yeah, yeah. has said that uh, that Shakespeare is uh, is is the best of twenty ten. Uh, it's, it's a weird feeling. It's the feeling of just being uh, being relieved that I didn't blow it. You know what I mean? <laughs> like it's. If there's really no, like, I, I'm really excited about it, I'm happy, but it doesn't, maybe people buy the album, which, which I really love, but, but as a comedian, you know, I feel like I'm always, like, as soon as that album was done, I'm kind of like, I'm thinking about the next thing, I'm thinking about that next hour already. Right. It's hard to really relax and rest on the laurels, but I know the album could have gone poorly. You know, you could have had a bad crowd, I could have just not, I could have done it a year earlier, yeah. you know, and, and not had the material quite there. I feel like that really captured kind of where I was as a comic right there. And it was a great show, and I was lucky enough to be working with great people at Comedy Central Records who, you know, helped put it together. That I think it all just kind of came together, and it's exactly the album that I wanted to put out. You know, it reminds me of just being getting into uh, being a kid and listening to "I Have a Pony" for the first time, mm-hmm. yeah. uh, Stephen Wright's album, and just being like, "Wow!" Like I could listen to this forever and almost study the jokes. And that's kind of what I wanted Shakespeare to be. It's something that, like, and this sounds so grandiose and, <laughs> and egotistical, uh, and it is. <laughs> but I wanted to be something that you know people would people who want to be comedians will listen to this as as you know something to study you know which I which I wanted and it easily could have it easily could have gone the other way or just not not been as good uh, and I'm, I couldn't be uh, more proud of the album. You know, Anthony, it's funny you say that because as soon as I heard it, I listened to it again and again, and then when we brought you on the show. We were talking about process. It wasn't just a, a conversation. Like we were interested. We never ask comedians about how they come up with jokes. That's ridiculous. That's a that's a terrible interview question. But with you, it's that album. Oh my god, that record. I, seriously, I, I can't oh, stop you. listening to it. Thank you so much. Do you find that you you'll come up with a like when you said before about going to the UCB theater, or, or when you were writing, you would have fifty jokes and you would pare it down to thirty and then pare it down to five? Are you kind of just setting up premises for yourself, like? Uh, my girlfriend likes chocolate, or my brother knows karate, and then just writing jokes from there? Or, or A little bit of that. Uh, a little bit where I'll think, you know, sometimes I'll have a topic. 
Like, I'll be like, for years I've been like, I'll be like suicide. Something that you cannot make people laugh at. You know, I'd be like, oh, suicide. I've got to have a suicide joke. And it would always be kind of in my head, running around my head. Like the latest one, breast cancer. You have no idea how fucking tough it is to make anyone laugh at, at, a, at any, like a breast cancer reference at all or rape or any of these things that I've, uh, I've somehow been lucky enough to, to do. Uh, but, uh. But I'll have those kind of in my head, or I'll literally think of like my girlfriend's addicted to chocolate. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll think of like that kind of cliched thing where you kind of feel like you know where it's going to go, that it's so cliche that you can't help yourself. Even though you know it's me on stage, I've been doing it for half an hour up there, and you know there's a twist coming. How can I get, how can I still fool you? You know, that I'll, I'll keep thinking, and sometimes it'll just, it'll pop into my head. You know, uh, I wrote like the one the other day just based on like the, my girlfriend's terrible in bed. Mm -hmm, you know, right. just like that kind of. Like that, something as simple as that, and it just, it's all just about like the outcome, you know, almost like a choose your own adventure where you have to, you just, you keep thinking until one really hits you where it's out of nowhere, hilarious, dark, it like fits all the requirements and it's rare, but it, it takes a lot of work. You know, I, I find that if I, if I try to write every day or keep thinking about jokes every day, that it keeps your brain going in that motion that you'll just pick up something, you know, walking around the streets or reading a book or watching TV that'll just pop in your head right there. You know, I'd say it's about, it's about, you know, 30% pop into my head, 30%, uh, 30% really working at it. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, 40% just, uh, the other one, <laughs> whatever, <laughs> is not, whatever is not one of those two. David Milch. Yeah. <laughs> the Milch method. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, and, and, and one th another thing too, just thinking, you, you'd mentioned making the joke about suicide. Uh, you know, you get to do that. Uh, the last track, uh, on Shakespeare involves an audience member coming up to you and, and complaining about how their town is a suicide capital. You can't make that yeah. joke. You've also got the standards and practice where you tell the joke and then talk about going through the standards and practices thing. Uh, and then there's the joke where you say, that uh, somebody should be staying home with their child and laughing at them <laughs> rather than at the comedian. I don't have the guts to say that joke. Yeah, but like, are people actually coming up to you this offended? That's what, maybe. I mean, maybe we don't include this in the interview because we want to preserve the mystique. But the whole time, I'm like, it's believable that people could have complained sure. about these things, but maybe they didn't. Uh, people don't complain to me very often because I think I seem like such a jerk that they they <laughs> stay away from me. You know. Right. Uh, the uh, the great Barrington story, the story at the end of Shakespeare. Oh, you guys have been a great crowd, great crowd. I mean, obviously, I've had way better, <laughs> but I've also had way worse. I'd like to leave you guys tonight by telling you about the worst crowd I ever had. It was a place called Great Barrington, Massachusetts. <laughs> you guys ever heard of Great Barrington? It's like a small town, a couple hours north of New York, and it's like a tiny place. It's a nice. But they just have one bar, and that's it. One that I'm doing a show there, and it is going great until I tell this joke. <laughs> I say, guys, favorite writer of all time, William Shakespeare. Love Shakespeare. Still read Shakespeare today. And people will argue with me that it's impractical to read so much Shakespeare. But let me learn you something. <laughs> if it wasn't for Romeo and Juliet... I would have totally overreacted when my fiancé killed herself. <laughs> now, clearly, that's not a joke for everybody, right? I mean, pretty much just people who read. <laughs> but wherever I go, at least like one guy, you know, one person will laugh at that joke, but not in Great Barrington, Massachusetts. In Great Barrington, it was like a dead, angry silence until a guy stands up and yells out, Great Barrington, Massachusetts is the suicide capital of the country. And we hate that stuff here. That's a tough situation. Luckily, I'm a professional. <laughs> I knew I had three options. Option number one, apologize to everyone. You know, so you guys, I'm really sorry. I didn't know that about your town. But if I had, I never would have told that joke. You know? Not my style. <laughs> option number two, point out the obvious. 
you should all move. <laughs> but instead, I went with option number three. I said, you know what? Fuck Great Barrington, Massachusetts. <laughs> the only good thing I can say about this town is the suicide rate isn't as high as it should be. <laughs> Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Here. Yes. Uh, it's pretty true. Like, it wasn't... They didn't yell it out while I was on stage. It was like I walked out afterwards. And like, I noticed that joke did really badly. <laughs> and I walked out and someone came up and was like, you shouldn't tell that joke here. Because in Great Barrington is not the suicide capital of the country, but it's like up there. Like a lot, of, it's a big, suicide's a big thing there. Like I'll tell that show here in New York and someone from Great Barrington will get really mad. Well, they'll write me an email how like, that's not Gra true. How many like, people are left in Great Barrington? <laughs> that uh, it's a tiny, it's a, it's a tiny little like, you know, town. Uh, <laughs> I think it's one of those things where it's like the weather is bad or something that makes people kind of gloomy. Right. But I remember someone being like, this is, it's one of the suicide capitals of the country. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just thought that was like hilarious. You know, like, what would the comeback be? And I, I think I just, I don't think, I'm not sure if I even said you should all move. <laughs> but it definitely occurred to me, you know, the, to say that afterwards. And I kind of came up with that story. The, uh, the standards and practices one is 100% true. Like 100%. <laughs> one year in high school, I had to take the standardized test, you know? It's supposed to tell me what I had to do with the rest of my life. And my results came back. I said that I had to either be a rocket scientist or run a laundry service or stop cheating off the Asian kid. <laughs> now that's a really smart joke. I mean, usually only Asian people get it. Try to do that joke on Late Night with Jimmy Fallon. First comedian to ever perform on that show. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know if that sounds like a big deal to all you guys. But it fucking should. And when you do stand-up on a TV show, you got to go through a thing called standards and practices. Do you know what I mean? Do you know what standards and practices is? It's like... It sounds like an official thing, right? Like they tell you what you can and can't say on TV based on how, based on how offensive uh, it is. And it sounds like it would be like really official, you know, but it's not. It's just one person who randomly works there that day. So they're always kind of ridiculous. And on Jimmy Fallon, they were like, Anthony, you can't tell that Asian joke. It's just this one woman. She goes, that's too offensive for us. You need to change it. I'm like, well, what do I have to change? She says, well, you can't say run a laundry service. That's the offensive part. You've got to change that to a different Asian stereotype. I mean, exact words. And I was like, really? Any other Asian stereotype is fine? And she says, no, Anthony, actually, not laundry service and not manicurist either. But anything else is cool. And I said, lady, that's insane. Doesn't leave me with any options. But she goes, you got five minutes to think of something, go. So I walk away, and I'm racking my brain, and finally I come back to her after five minutes, and I say, okay, how about instead of saying, run a laundry service, I say, build a railroad. <laughs> a lot of you were laughing. The rest of you should have fucking gone to class. <laughs> I'm not even going to explain what that means. Just know that build a railroad is a billion times more offensive. <laughs> a billion times more offensive than running a laundry service. And this woman looks me right in the eyes. Says, Anthony, 
build a railroad? That's perfect. (laughs) Now, the point of that story is the people who get offended by jokes are fucking stupid. Like I can't, I couldn't believe it at the time. I was like, I felt like this is a really funny thing to say. The uh, the line about uh, you know changing it from uh, uh, from run a laundry service for an Asian stereotype to build a railroad. And I don't know if they just didn't get the reference, or the, but they, when they were like, that's perfect. I I was blown away <laughs> by that. But by, by that, and it like perfectly sums up people getting offended by jokes. Like I never understand people really getting offended by things. Yeah. Uh, or people saying that I'm mean when it's all made up. <laughs> Everyone's fictional. Everyone. Where it's like it's, I think like someone the other day was talking about like I did a show where someone was like Lindsay Lohan's going to kill herself this year, and the crowd applauded. And then I was <laughs> like, jokes, and they were like all offended, and I'm like, you just got excited about a real person's death, and I'm making up these totally fictional things, and you're getting upset about it. It's endlessly fascinating yeah. to me. Well, and I, and think, I love just to push that button. It's amazing, because I think on the CD, I think your brother, through the run of the CD, changes ages, which you could have different brothers, Yeah, but you're a always lot of different to things my brother. Happen to a lot him. of different yeah. things. He has like four different jobs throughout the whole thing. Like, it's clear <laughs> that, that yeah. this is oh, just uh, a thing. Absolutely. Or people will call me out for that. They'll be like, but I thought your mom, your mom and dad were divorced. And I'm just like, fuck you, joke police. Like, you know, <laughs> It doesn't matter, but people really kind of like that that through line. But again, I like that kind of like that mystique, like is it real, is it not, uh, kind of thing. It's, it's just fun to do, but right. it baffles me that people people kind of harp on things. Well, there's that uh, kind the, of the, the other one joke. The other thing you talked about the uh, you should be at home laughing at your kid. That uh, <laughs> that did not really happen. That's totally made up. <laughs> I but I started that. telling. I decided that I wanted to have jokes about retarded people because it became like. It became the thing you couldn't talk about anymore. That was your so was first like, well, press I've write, answer. I've got to write jokes about it. But I would do it, and people would get really upset, and the jokes would not do well. And then I would tell that one at the end, mm-hmm. and they go fucking crazy. <laughs> they like they laugh so it's like the biggest laugh of my whole act. And I'm just like, well, fuck you, then you can't get if you laugh with that, it makes everything else I do okay. I love the idea that you are sitting around thinking, like you're just imagining this dad. <laughs> 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 I just thought that would be like, it would be like the worst thing someone could say during a show. That would shut everybody up. Yeah. <laughs> and when I tell that story on stage, no one thinks there's a joke coming. Everyone thinks yeah. that I'm somehow like having a serious moment. I, I love <laughs> one of my favorites. And it almost makes me mad that I did it on the album because now I've written retarded jokes since Yeah. that I feel like I couldn't use again because it's impossible to do them and then get the crowd back without saying <laughs> that uh, laughing at your kid joke. It's tough. Well, it's funny because you're running down these taboos throughout the show. Like you could be like a, a checklist of taboos, and yet people are still offended when you hit the next one. <laughs> yeah, they don't. I, I mean, it, it's crazy to me, but I found that people can be offended and still be having a good time. You know, one of the first things I learned in stand-up, someone told me that stuck with me, was uh, don't get upset if the crowd doesn't laugh at a joke or they don't laugh at a couple jokes in a row because they're still being entertained. Mm-hmm. You know, if you're at home watching a TV show, a comedy, and you're not laughing the whole time, you're still being entertained watching it. So just keep going. Where I've done shows like at colleges where the crowd is like, they gasp at things and they get upset, and then they give me a standing ovation when I leave. Well, yeah, yeah. You know, kind of when, that you just have to be confident enough in what you're doing that, that you never waver. You know, if I tell a rape joke and, and then I'll, all of a sudden I like look like, oh, no, I shouldn't have done that, then the crowd thinks that too. But if I just keep on going, you know, if I'm like, or even make a joke, like, oh, I'm sorry that offended you, I'll make it up to you with four more rape jokes. You know, <laughs> that kind of overkill is the thing that kind of wins them, wins them back. Well, and then you've got that line where you say the thing about how if you're ooing, you're just laughing, but like a pussy or whatever it is yeah. you say. It's like, yeah, ooing is just laughing, but for pussies. <laughs> yeah. And that's like you're telling everybody in the audience, I can't be like, I can't be offending you that much because you're still here. Yeah. Totally, yeah. totally. Or just like, or just you know, get your shit together. You know, there's, there's <laughs> ooing. There's no reason to ever ooh. It's a joke. I, I, I never understood the ooh, and it's contagious. If we, one person who's the whole crowd will ooh. You know, it's a weird, 
it's a weird thing to me that I've, that, that's always I, I just like ooing and I really just like a groan. If somebody groans at a joke, I will never tell it again. <laughs> yeah, I think it's so, the audience judging itself. It's like a it's like a PC kind of wave over the a top. Bit. Yeah. I don't think yeah, it has no anything to do with the jokes. Yeah. <laughs> People don't do when they're mad about it. They ooh just because they feel like it's like a it's better than laughing. I don't know. But I uh, I really enjoy saying that one. <laughs> is is there anything <laughs> is there anything that you won't like is there any time that you've written anything and you've been and you've thought, No, I can't. I can't I can't do this. I can't say uh, this. Yes. Yeah. Yes. There was one I had a joke with just the one. word in it. Uh, hmm. Yeah, pretty much. I think I had a joke with the. Or, like, there are things that I've tried that have like the reaction has been so. Like, I, I, I want to be funny as well. Mm-hmm. You know yeah. what I mean? It's not like I'm just like I'm not just trying to keep people's teeth in. Uh, I need I, where I I kind of am, but I also need to be able to to uh, to back it up too. You know, I feel like any of my jokes, if people got really upset. I could still in a conversation talk my way through it or rationalize what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. But I had one joke that I told to a, I told to a couple comics, and they like thought it was hilarious. Uh, and like racism is always a tricky, mm-hmm. you know, a, tr- a tricky thing w- with jokes. And I don't ever want to appear racist, but racism, and, and I don't think that I'm a racist person, uh, but uh, I feel like racism is something that exists and people don't want to ever hear about that. I kind of like playing with that logic a little bit. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but I also feel like I can defend all the jokes, but I had one that was, uh, <laughs> this is a tough, I'll, I'll try to say it as cleanly as I can. Uh, <laughs> It was, uh, I, went to a, I went to a mostly white high school, and some of those kids were really mean. They used to call me N-word lover just because I love to use the word N-word. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, like, I thought, what is ballsier than using the N-word twice in a joke? You know what I mean? But I, I just could not, I could not bring myself to say it. You know, I, I always thought if you, like, if you can't tell it in front of black people, it's racist. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, uh, and I've got a couple, I've got like a new one now that, that is, that is, deals with racism. It's about like my, my dad, and it's not true, but it's like my dad's racist. <laughs> mm-hmm. Uh, he, but he tried to be a good father. Like, he would tell me that Santa Claus was black. That way, when I found out he didn't exist, it wouldn't be that big a letdown. Um, <laughs> that, that I feel like it's like about someone being racist, not like I'm not racist. And it makes sense, like, as a logical, a racist person would do that. Right. But, uh, but uh, so I feel like I can say that and be able to defend it, even though people in the crowd will not, will get upset. Well, and, and I'll, I'll comment on it, but it's not, but it's not like that other joke. I, I just couldn't do the other one. Would you be- I think a lot of the jokes aren't explicitly about the topics, but they're, uh, we're working around them. Or they're about you. That's the thing. Yeah. It's, it's like you're, it's like all, every one of those jokes where you're awful, uh, you know, it's almost like the joke is you're this scumbag. You know what I mean? Like it, it not that you are Anthony, but no, the, you're the, terrific. The the of character course, is, <laughs> and, and it, it's almost like I guess that people could, you know, you you've got that as your defense with those two jokes. But I wonder, like, would people take it the wrong? Like, are you? Would you be worried about people taking it the wrong way and and not you know maybe liking it too much too? Exactly. Exactly. Like it. It. it pains me less to offend uh, a person of color, you know, uh, than, it do- than it does to, uh, to get a crowd excited, you know, like a, a, to get like a really racist crowd excited. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. People start like, if people give me a standing ovation on that joke, and, like a whole white audience, I would be really freaked out. I, I, did, I had a joke, you know, I don't even know, I think it's on the album about being adopted, Yes. My parents told me, I was like, why'd you pick me? And they said, well, you were special because of all the babies we had to choose from. You were the only one that was white, <laughs> which is like a, a comment on like, you know, a white baby is more valuable because there's less of them, you know, on the market. It wasn't like that. And I feel like I can defend it that way. That, you know, and usually, like, you know, different, uh, different races love that joke for the most part. You know, like mm-hmm. I can, that joke is better in an all black room than it would in, <laughs> in an all white room because white people get like uptight. But I got like a, I did it on TV. And I got like a fan letter from like a white supremacist in Florida. And it was terrifying. Jesus. Like just, he was just like, thank you for not apologizing for your race and for wow. saying that white people are better than black people. And I was so scared. Like I didn't know what to do. You know, it, it really, it, it was, it was really, it was really tough to take. And it was also extra tough because I, you know, it was early on in my career and I was like, well, what if I become like the, the comic of the clan, you know, they offer me ten thousand dollars to come to a show. What do I do then? 
Well, that's you good know, money. I ask if I could wear a hood. I don't know. Well, so it how would have been? Uh, it would have been tough. What was he like? What else was the in this letter? Do you? Yeah, like, geez. That it was like, just. It, it was just thank you for you know for for not apo- like so, so many comics are you know make fun of white people or like you know white comics make fun of themselves and like black people are cool white people do this uh, or like uh, kind of apologizing for being white. If you didn't do that. You said like we're the best, and if you think it's racist, I don't care. You know, which is kind of like one was like the tag to the joke. Like some people think that joke's racist, but what they don't understand is I don't care. <laughs> but that was like I was like, you missed the point, and it just it really that really freaked me out. That really freaked me out. Well, the topics that you're dealing with, and you you've set up this loose reality that's clearly it's it's skewed for a reason. <laughs> people are yeah. picking and choosing what to believe is true. Yeah. And that's pretty totally. scary for sure. Plus, I, also, I feel like I'm being mean, like in a vacuum. No one's being affected except the crowd in front of me. When there's people who like, you know, preach about the war and they're like, these, like, we need to kill these ragheads and we need, to, and like that, th- I think that's awful. That's like, yeah, that's, that's way meaner than anything that I do. But I think I just appear mean. I don't know if it's because it's like, because people kind of fill in the blanks with their imagination. I don't, I don't get why it is. But it's a, but it's a, it's a strange, uh, it's a strange thing to me. Do you, do you find that you, uh, like you, you, you know, you start reading a crowd and you, you'll tone it down a little bit, or do you just kind of play it to the hilt all the time when you, when you see this, this kind of stuff happen? Uh, if anything, it gets amped up because yeah. I don't, <laughs> if the crowd is bad, because I don't have any fallback. The only thing I can do <laughs> for my act is to do crowd work, which occasionally I want, if I'm getting paid for a show, you know, sometimes I'll feel like, well, let me just talk to the crowd. And I'm just kind of the same character. But it's like in the moment, you know, and it just, it just, there's not that much on the line and time flies by when you're making fun of some girl in the crowd, you know, mm-hmm. uh, but I can do that. But if they don't really like the jokes, I don't have any easier jokes. So it kind of makes, but, uh, but it also like I'm having less fun. So everything seems meaner. <laughs> if I'm having a great set. I'll tell a really mean joke and the crowd gets it. They know what I'm doing and then I'll smile. Like I can't help myself, but I'll smile in between jokes. Right. Yeah. And the crowd will go nuts and they like that. And it makes it, it kind of makes it easier on everybody. But if I'm not having fun and I'm not smiling, I'm just telling these jokes and I know how it's going to go. <laughs> and I know that it's going to be bad. So it's just like, I'm just like, Oh, I got to tell this one now. And it just gets, and it just is this cycle of awfulness. Like that joke I have about, uh, about a woman coming up to me after a show and complaining about a joke I have about uh, about a baby drowning in a bathtub. <laughs> right. You know, and she said, she tells me, I, lo- I just want you to know I lost two babies and I appreciate that joke. Uh, and I say, well, you know, if I had known that, I would have told it twice. <laughs> uh, that actually happened work. I was doing a show and I was, it was my first times on the road and I was like, oh my God, this is awful. And I, but I, I had, it, that was a new joke, that drowning a baby in a bathtub. Mm-hmm. And the whole time I'm on stage, I'm thinking, Wait till I get to this joke. Then they'll come on board. <laughs> and then I told it toward the end of my set, and oh my god, I've never, I've never heard a crowd get more upset and disgusted, and mm-hmm. just oh, that was that was that was a tough one. But you, tough you one. kept it though, like you had the faith in that joke to it's keep funny. it, or was it like once you added that thing about the woman coming up to you that you're like, okay, this joke now, it, you know, it's like the. Uh, the, the tag you were doing with the, the, the father staying home to laugh at his son. Like, was that what you needed to be like, okay, this is something that I can, uh, I can keep in here and, and get laughed. No, that was, uh, that, you know, that, that tag kind of helped, but it wasn't, but it wasn't like, oh, now I can keep telling this joke. There's some, like a, a lot of things with comics is like, you know, a comic will tell a new joke on stage yeah mm-hmm. and it'll, it'll bomb, but the walk off stage and the, another comic friend will say, Hey, that joke, that's a great joke. And the comic's like, oh, really? And they'll tell it for months and keep bombing with it <laughs> and then finally get sick of it and, and get rid of it. But but I, I have a couple jokes where, where people, like, the crowd never laughs or they get really uncomfortable. But I know, I know that it's an awesome joke. You know, that, maybe <laughs> that was one of those. I've got a couple, like, newer ones now that are like that. Uh, like, the, the, I have this new breast cancer joke um, that it, that is almost impossible to laugh at almost impossible uh but i know that as a joke it's fucking brilliant <laughs> so i just won't i'll eat it on stage for that for that 30 seconds and probably for a couple minutes afterwards because it's hard to get them back and the most i can do for the crowd <laughs> is put a joke after it that will kind of like that's kind, not middle of the rope but like a little 
that everyone can kind of laugh at. Mm-hmm. You know, that's not as tough, but that's the, that's the best I can do. So when you're keeping this stuff <laughs> in, then are you are you, like from night to night? Are you are you changing your phrasing at all? Are you playing with it any just to to tighten it up a bit, or is it just like no? I'm going to throw it out the same just as waiting I did last for that night, crowd. and I'm just waiting for the crowd that that gets it. Uh, it depends on the joke, you know, and I, I feel like if it's a crowd that's there for me and they know exactly who I am and they're all there for me, then they'll go nuts for this joke, you know, mm-hmm. it's very me. But if it's just a, if it's just like a, you know, a crowd of just people from, you know, in town, out of town, a, kind of a, a big mix section, then uh, sometimes I'll play around with it, but sometimes I'll have a joke that's like the wording is perfect. I can make it longer if I if I wanted to for some reason, but the, it's it's boiled down to its essence and it's perfect, and I can't change it. But like that joke about you know my dad saying Black Santa Claus, yeah. that had changed from me saying, you know, I have all my friends have kids, even my racist friends have kids, which is weird because they you know and I would kind of go into it from that point of view, mm-hmm. and that ne- it didn't really work that well. But people would say I love that joke, or that's mm-hmm. such a great joke. That I just that eventually I think I kind of worked it into making it my dad just to kind of make it a little a little shorter a little easier so I will play with phrasing sometimes but mm-hmm. sometimes the joke comes out and it's it's you can't touch it. <laughs> Do you find you've got more people coming now to see you since the release of Shakespeare? Like has that has has that put it so you've got people that will raise the profile a bit? Yeah, I think it's helped a little bit. You know, I don't. Uh, I don't know how much. You know, I, I noticed that you know, sometimes there's a show where some people clap a little louder for me than they used to. You know, if I'm yeah. on a showcase show, or it's helped. You know, I've gotten these, so a little few more gigs on the road. You know, I think it's. Uh, I think it's helped a lot. Uh, but yeah, I mean, everything is just kind of like they're all just kind of baby steps. Right. You know, I've been on TV a bunch of times, and I've, I've done you know uh, a half hour special and, and all kinds of different stuff that has helped. Uh, and I think the album will help a lot more, and it's always there. You know, it'll always be there, mm-hmm. and uh, and I think it'll it'll continue to uh, to help. Are there are there any plans to release? Because it's a digital only release right now, right? Uh, yeah. Well, I get I got the albums. The deal with the new Comedy Central, oh, okay. and they're doing a lot of these now. Is like, and I think it's really helped comedy and stand up albums because you can. There's almost no risk in putting out an album anymore for a yeah. company um, to put it out. But I have CDs that I can sell on the road. Oh, okay, but I that's think, good. And then. Uh, yeah, so I, I've got copies myself, but I think in the next few months, maybe I don't know how long it's going to take to, uh, I don't know how long it's going to take to actually get the machine going and put them in stores. But it's been successful enough that uh, the Comedy, Comedy Central is going to put them out in stores uh, uh, sooner rather than later. There was like a magic number you kind of had to hit, and I, I haven't hit it yet, but I'm, but I'm close, close to it. But the, but the uh, discussion is is being being had, and it's really it's there's kind of like a, a rebirth in the comedy album that's gone on in the last. You know, I'd say probably five or six years. Like yeah. you're seeing them a lot more now, and I guess is probably because it's easier to get get them online. Or I don't know what it is, but there's so many. Like, did you think when you started in 2002 that like were comedy albums even a thing for you then? Like, did that were people thinking of them then? Uh, I don't know how much people thought of them because yeah. you, you couldn't really make money off of them, and it was a order when things started to get downloaded illegally. You know, uh, yeah. But I always wanted to, just thinking about I Have a Pony, you know, or thinking about uh, strategic grill locations, you know, two yeah. albums that yeah. I listened to a million times that I always wanted to put one out. But now I think it's where it's gotten easier to put them out because recording techniques are a lot less expensive, and you can throw it up on iTunes as opposed to having to press, you know, thousands of copies. Um, that That's really helped a lot. But also I think that it, it's kind of, I think it's also going away, whereas now the new thing is the DVD. Right. You know, yeah. that that's what people will buy. I think it's because it's harder to copy and because you can put it up on Comedy Central or something that the next thing I do, and maybe I'll do an audio version for a CD, but the next thing I'm thinking about is certainly uh, the hour special. Like you see with Comedy Central where it used to be the Comedy Central Presents was the big thing that everyone could do. Yeah. Now they've done so many for so many years that most people are, a lot of people anyway, are pushing past that and just doing their own hour that they can produce themselves and sell and sell the DVD on their own or sell it to Comedy Central or Showtime and take care of things that way. Right, right. So that's what that's is that what's next for you? You're, you're, you're putting together a, a new hour for uh, for kind a, of, a I mean, special. I'm trying to turn over my act, you know, just because when people come out, they don't hear just just what's on the album. Yeah. Uh, but also, you know, I, I, the DVD is what's next, or doing doing a special is what's next. But I don't know how soon that's going to be. I don't right. want to put a time limit on it. You know, the album is you know eight years of of joke writing to make that the best album I could that I'm not going to just say in a year I'm going to do this and hopefully the jokes are good. I'm going to make damn sure that it's as high a quality, if not better, than Shakespeare. Uh, but also, you know, I'm, I'm getting busier now. You know, I, I'm getting, you know, a little more writing work here and there and, you know, hopefully doing some acting and stuff and things that will kind of raise my profile. 
but it also takes me away from, from writing, you know, writing jokes, from writing as much stuff for myself as I can. Yeah. What, what about like when you worked? Yeah, you, know, you know, you you did some writing for for Jimmy Fallon when he had first started out. That's is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, like first year I on that show. I when when you, when he when you're writing like monologue jokes for him, like is it easier for you where you're really kind of writing for a character to step into writing for his character on those those kind of things, or were you even doing monologues when you were when you were on that show? Uh, I was I was pretty much only doing monologues. Right. I would chip in on other things, but one of my, I mean, one of the reasons I got into stand up was because I wanted to I wanted to write jokes. I thought being a joke writer seemed like a, fu- a fun thing to do. And uh, and I was of course wrong, uh, but uh, you know, uh, you know, six or seven years into that, I I got this job on Fallon, and it was the perfect situation, you know, where you were kind of starting a show, and so there was no, you know, you were kind of like you were kind of making that voice, and it was setting wasn't the bar, so much yeah. a voice as it was uh, as it was just writing a clean, you know, funny joke, but it had to be about the news, mm-hmm. and it wasn't. Uh, I didn't enjoy it as much as I had hoped I would, you know, it just wasn't. It wasn't fun having to write jokes about Obama's tax plan. You know, I just didn't <laughs> enjoy that or particularly care about, you know, hitting celebrities and things like that, which just became kind of a grind. Mm-hmm. And yeah. it's very much a grind. You know, you're writing 70 jokes a day. But it helped me. Tr- I mean, the, the experience was great. I loved everyone I worked with, and it, it was fun to, to be a part of that show for the first year. Um, but I compared it to kind of working out in a gym. Like, you, like you, it's almost like I was trapped in a gym for a year. And I would just stand up every night, but I wasn't writing for myself that much because I was I was cranking out seventy jokes a day for the show. Uh, but once I got out of there after a year, it's like it took me a month to kind of decompress, and then I realized, wow, like I can really bang out uh, my joke writing is sharper and it's a little easier, and kind of just it just I, I felt like a much stronger person. I didn't realize it, mm-hmm. a much stronger joke writer. Right after a year of uh, after a year of writing on that show. So, what are these writing projects that are coming up now? Um, are, you, uh, you know, are you allowed they, to say or? or? Oh, totally. I mean, they go, I mean, the writing, I'm trying to kind of get away from it a little bit. You know, something, some, you know, a friend will be hosting something and they'll ask me for some jokes. Right, you know, right. Usually that's fun, like, write for a Sarah Silverman or write for like a friend of mine, like Paul Shear, ask me to do stuff. And that's really fun because if I think something's great, they'll think it's great and they'll <laughs> do their best to be able to use it. Yeah. Uh, but then I wrote for like an award show recently that was <laughs> the goddamn bane of my existence. Like, I, <laughs> I, I I thought, you know, the, the money was good, so I thought, okay, I turned down a bunch of times, and then they were, it came back again, and I thought, well, you know, I, I didn't make much during the holidays, I'll take this job, and I hated every second of it, but I would <laughs> never do that, something like that again. It was just, it was just awful. Who are you writing really for? Uh, but now I'm writing, I'm not even, it's, I mean, it's not really a writing job, as right. much as I'm going to be, I wrote for The Roast last year, the uh, the Comedy Central Roast. Okay. Of, uh, of David Hasselhoff. Do you, do you guys get you guys have the Comedy Network there? Right? Yeah, we, yeah, we, we get, get the roasts. roasts. Now, like, now the that roasts. the roasts have become this like flagship thing for Comedy Central, we we get them too right many away. roasts. Yeah. yeah, they're they're Super Bowl basically, uh, and that's always, I mean that's always been a dream. I love those things, uh, and I wrote on the last one for Hasselhoff, and now this year they're doing Donald Trump in March, and I'm going to be one of the roasters. Oh, yeah. So, uh, so I've just been writing like crazy roast jokes, uh, you know, <laughs> as much as I can. Where I'm, that's pretty much all I'm focused on. Where jokes will come to me for my act, but I, I'm pretty much going going full tilt, balls to the wall in this roast. Are you are you uh, able to test your roast jokes out, you know, outside of 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 Comedy Central, like, or do you? Have, um, how do you test a roast? Yeah, joke? how do you test it? It's that's tough. I mean, I can run it by people, you know, uh, mm-hmm. if I want to. You know, my girlfriend's a comedian who I can, I can, I can kind of run things by her. Um, sometimes I'll even listen to her. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but I, uh, there are a couple people I can run it by. But you can't. You, the, the biggest fear is that joke getting out because it ruins out all the surprise. So yeah. a lot of those guys, like Jeff Ross or like Whitney Cummings, will go to a couple different clubs, you know, the week before and try some out. But I, I'm kind of terrified of that. So I think I might go by UCB, you know, a night or two before, or I might go by the Comedy Cellar one night. Mm-hmm. But I'm also com- it's, it's going to be in New York, so I'm going to be kind of competing with the guy like Jeff Ross who wants to go out and try his jokes, and we can't be on the same show, you know, because it, even if we don't watch each other, if, if he does it goes after me and someone's like, oh, Jeff Ross is a joke like that, that will destroy me. So I've got you've got to <laughs> kind of keep it you've got to keep it very hush hush. You know, when they do even do rehearsals now. They, they empty the room before the comic comes up and it kind of rehearses their act. Wow! Because everyone's paranoid of, of people knowing about it. That's like that's that's. I didn't know that's that's like that's the serious. Oscars. Yeah. So you get Price Waterhouse Coopers to protect your jokes and stuff. Oh, I mean, I wish they would. I wish <laughs> they would do that. I mean, they, they used to not even give them to the show. Like the comics would just show up, and the celebrities kind of stuff is pre written in advance. But the comics yeah. would just kind of show up and do it. But I think in the last year they got it where the comics have to submit their jokes because. Uh, 
well, they don't they don't have to, but they should. That way, you don't have to sit there paying attention to everyone crossing out jokes of yours that you can't do anymore. <laughs> yeah. So you can kind of be a little more locked in, uh, which I think is a better way to do it, to be honest. But right now, I'm just writing, you know, hundreds of jokes and just to narrow it down to the best, you know, seven or eight minutes that to do to do on the show. Right, right. Well, we we look forward to it, uh, Anthony. We're running out of time here, so we've got to uh, say time thank you. By, time yeah. just flew by. This has been a lot of fun. Uh, everybody, check out the uh, the roasts coming up in in March and in the new. Uh, and download later Shakespeare. On. Get Shakespeare. It's on iTunes. Uh, I think it's on emusic.com. dot com. Go see Anthony. Is there is there any dates that you're, you're going to be? Anybody want to go see you in the next next week or two? Uh, no, I'm doing a couple colleges. I'll be in Los Angeles for a few weeks. Uh, for a few weeks in February. And then you can just check out my website, anthonyjustling.com. I've got a bunch of tour dates up there and then more coming, uh, more coming every week. So just check that out and hopefully I'll, uh, I'll be in your area soon. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming on the show, Anthony. Thanks, Anthony. Thanks for having me, guys. It was a real pleasure. Yeah, it was great. We'll talk to you soon. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. That was a terrific interview. Oh, I, you know what? Uh, that was that was that was a great. That was just like uh, Shakespeare is a record for the ages. This is an Am I Right show for the ages. Am I Right has just been top notch this year. I know we've got so far this year. Anthony Jeselnik, Bob Kerr, Paul Tompkins. How like? Uh, Sky's the limit. Is, like, Sky's the limit. The year has started off here, and I'm holding my hand at about twelve and, uh, who, out of ten. Who's coming up? Who's coming up? Oh well, shh, let's keep that a secret. Just because we haven't confirmed them yet, I don't want to. Okay, but the, but it's, the outlook is good. The outlook is good. We're shaking the Am I Right eight ball, and it says uh, it doesn't say Ask Again. Doesn't say Outlook is not good. It, it says, says Outlook is fucking good. It says Stay tuned to Am I Right uh, on CJSW dot com ninety point nine FM CJSW dot com slash podcasts. You know what? Follow us at Am I Right CJSW, please. Yeah, or uh, find us on Facebook Am I Right CJSW. <laughs> You have been listening to a CGSW podcast. For more podcast initiatives, visit our website at cgsw.com slash podcast.